welcome back to TGTV and more specifically ladies and gentlemen welcome back to my Ferrari Testarossa now I do apologize in the delay in getting this video out the weather has been uh, less than temperate there's been mud ball good wood uh, you name it to contend with so we're finally in my Testarossa and it's time to give you guys and girls a rundown of what it's like to live with what it's like to drive and some of probably the frankly depressing running costs of this car so then this video was brought to you by car vertical if you're looking to buy a used car particularly it is worth you getting involved with car vertical and getting a report on that car car vertical will search through in a huge database of insurance and all the rest of it to make sure there's no mileage discrepancies x damage outstanding finance recalls and loads of different hidden nasties car vertical will be able to find that for you and it will alert you before you buy the car whether or not what you're buying is what it seems so big shout out to car vertical i will leave the link below to go and get your report and a discount code as well it's particularly important when you're buying old cars like this They've been around the block a few times and it's very, very easy for dealers to hide things. With Car Vertical, there really is no more hiding. Now then, let's crack on and get stuck into this video. I didn't want to rush it out doing a lap of YouTube Square. I wanted to take this car out on, uh, on some twisties and some country roads and really give you guys and girls a flavor of what it's actually like to live with, um, frankly, an icon like the Ferrari Testarossa. I've had this car now for about eight weeks and I must admit, I've driven it about six times which is appalling for me, but I'm so busy trying to afford the bloody thing that I haven't had time to take it out. And the weather's been absolutely appalling as well. And I'm trying not to take her out in the rain because being an 80s Ferrari, rain does not go well with it. And I've had enough of rust for the time being. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and dodge rust for now. Anyway, down to second gear. We're gonna park up. Now, throughout this video, you're going to see some rear view shots of this car. It's kind of really cool, kind of fisheye lens, 360 rear view shots of this car. That is actually shot on an Insta360 camera. Loads of you have been asking me on my Instagram when I did a reel of this car, what do you shoot it on? It's on an Insta360, so you're gonna see some shots from there whilst we're hooning along, and you're gonna hear it as well. That is all with the inbuilt mic, so camera tech nerdery underway. Let's park up then, and let's chat all things Testarossa. So here she is then. I bang on about it all the time, so you probably know the spec by now, but if you've missed the collection video of this car where I bored on about the spec, it is a UK right-hand drive mono specchio, mono dado wheel Testarossa. So it is thought there's only around 40 of these in the UK originally, and God knows how many of those are now left in this particular configuration, arguably the collectible configuration, which we're gonna bore on about in a second. Obviously, it's Rosso over Crema, and being Classic A certified, it is largely unmodified and untouched, save for potentially the grill badge there, which I'm told may have been an option from new, may have been an aftermarket option from Ferrari. We don't know at this point. And also on the front there, the same. We've got a little chromed uh, stallion on the front there as well. Again, we don't know whether or not that was offered to Testarossa owners by Ferrari down the line, whether or not it's an aftermarket thing completely, or whether or not you could actually option it on the car from you. We don't know at this point. However, the rest of the car has been at Classic A certified, meaning every single crevice, cranny, nook, and bolt and part and everything in there, basically it's been photographed in a huge file of facts declaring by Ferrari that it is all original. Very, very cool. It's iconic, it's artwork on wheels, and it's something that I just had to have at some point in my collection. I grew up wanting one of these so much, and I thought, if I don't do it now, I'm gonna lose these things forever. So let's jump in anyway. You don't want me strolling around the car pontificating. You want me in there driving and giving it some beans. So let's jump in and go for a little drive. Tight country roads, <laughs> 1.9 meter wide Testarossa, 1.7 tons. We've got a big fat flat 12 right behind me there, punting out 380 brake horsepower. It is a smidge under five liters and naught to 60. Oh God, it is about five seconds, this is hell. 
it's no slouch even by today's standards. I suspect in the 30 odd years since this was new, that 0 to 60 time has dipped slightly, but it certainly, it pulls like a train. All right, let's go down. Third gear, here we go. Up to fifth, and you get that click clack with the metal gated gearbox there. Let's fold that down. Now Ferrari released this car to the world at the 1984 Motor Show. When this thing was unveiled, Jaws hit the floor. It was unlike anything that had been seen before. The side strakes, the size of the thing, it caused an absolute scene. Now I don't remember that firsthand. Contrary to popular belief, I wasn't actually there. I wasn't born in 1984. But I can only imagine the way that the world received this thing when it first came out. And of course when it came out, it had the silly flying wing mirror on it. By the time the car hit production, the flying wing mirror still stayed, but that only stayed about a year or so until it was scrapped altogether in favor of conventional door mirrors. Now, interestingly, we call wing mirrors, wing mirrors when they're actually normally placed on doors, but this is actually more of a wing mirror than a wing mirror, uh, but I've been told off by my audience before for calling it a wing mirror. So it's an apella mirror, whatever we call it. How does that translate into daily driving? Is it a nightmare to drive with just one wing mirror? That is surprisingly ergonomic. It's right in your eye line and you can't help but kind of see peripherally what's going on. It's actually better placed than mirrors down there. You don't need to take your eye off where you're going to know what's going on over your shoulder there. However, the same cannot be said for the other side. I do not have a mirror at all over there, meaning, and I check them all the time anyway, but you have to have a look over your shoulder there. There's quite good visibility out of the back window there, so you don't feel too blind. If this was in something like an SV with one wing mirror, like an Aventador SV, I mean, that would be a stressful affair, but this, not so bad. So the test source is not doing too badly for practicality. What's ride like? How is it to drive? How is it to use every single day? Is it a nightmare? Now, today is a very hot day. I'm sweating, but the aircon does work brilliantly. I've turned it down for the purposes of this video, because you're probably gonna find it difficult to hear me as it is. Uh, but the aircon actually works really well in here. So livability wise, in that respect, it's actually fine. The width, as I touched on before, it looks like a very, very wide car, but only 1.9 something meters. It's about the same width as a Pista. It's narrower than my SLS. Um, it's about the same width as the Carrera GT, maybe a bit wider. It's really not that much of a pig to drive around. And smoothness wise, it's not bad at all. You come off the gas and you let it roll, the engine doesn't do much braking for you. This was designed by Ferrari to be a tourer. It wasn't designed to be an up and atom kind of uh, twisty B-road smasher. This was designed to be kind of a cruiser, something you go down to the south of France in. Uh, and I think they've done a really, really good job of that. Again, these seats, I mean, you'd have more lateral support on something from DFS, but really, do you need it? Or are you really gonna be slamming this around a track? No, I don't know any Testarossa owners that track their cars. Uh, will you be taking these to sort of hairpins and horrible twisties? Again, probably not to tell you the truth. That's not what this car's for. As I said before, it's 1.7 tons. It's a heavy car. It's a big old boy. You've got a massive five liter flat 12 behind your head over there, powering the back wheels. It's not necessarily something you'd want to really smash around any twisties whatsoever. And you can feel it through the suspension. Not that you can feel anything now because we're stuck in a little bit of snow moving traffic. It's very definitely built for comfort and they've done an amazing job with that. And I would dare say that this is a nicer, easier cruiser than my 911 Targa of the same age. This is actually more comfortable. This is very livable with. The box feels very tight, very precise. You can hear the click clack between each gears. You can just, you just get that amazing Ferrari manual gearbox noise, which is just iconic. It is a five-speed dogleg box, so don't forget that first gear is actually where second usually is, and reverse gear is where uh, first usually is. If you get that wrong, um, you'll be building a new gearbox for yourself. Sound is just, it's really raw. It's really kind of gruff. It's not that high-pitched uh, Formula One noise that the V12 and the F12 makes. It's a different tone. It's a different beast entirely, but it just pulls and pulls and pulls from low revs. Now we're approaching a town here. Ordinarily I'd get stressed in a lot of my other classics, but this, 
eh, not so bad. It gets a lot of respect as well, which makes your driving experience just that little bit easier. People let you out, people don't hate you. You get thumbs up, toots, you know, people taking pictures. It makes your driving experience a lot more pleasant versus something like the Hurricane where you drive around and people absolutely hate you. They think a drug dealer's arrived. But in this, you're just kind of unanimously loved. It's not so noisy and shouty that people kind of scowl at you. It just makes a reassuring noise. You know, these people. Young or old, everyone loves a Testarossa. Why did I buy the car? Oh, 458, lovely. No front plate, naughty, naughty. So there isn't a person I've driven past that has said anything rude. Whereas in a Lamborghini, I would say every other person you drive past says something rude about you. You can see it in your rear view mirror. You can see them muttering uh, various four letter words under their breath. But with Testarossa, you don't get any of that. It's fantastic. Why did I buy the car? Why did I get one of these? Why this and not a 355? Why this and not any other 80s idle? Why not a 930 turbo? A, because I've got enough Porsches for now. And B, for me, this was the poster car. And C, this example that came up, I couldn't turn down. For me, buying a Testarossa, it has to be the one wing mirror. It has to be the knock on wheels. Uh, it has to be red, Rosso, Testarossa, you know. Testarossa actually means redhead, and that's because the rocker covers on the engine were painted red. And that was actually after, I think, a 50s racing car. So, nice little bit of heritage. It's pin and Farina designed, and as I say, it was just absolutely, when this car came up, no questions asked, I had to have this particular car. The history with it is absolutely incredible. As I bored on at the collection video, I'm gonna go in here and turn around actually. At the collection video, it's got literally everything. Nobody's even farted near the car in its 30 year history without a piece of paper to prove it. It's completely bonkers. It's done 23,000 miles, which is actually a, a reassuring amount of miles for a car of this age. You don't really want something that sat around because if it has, you need to have proof that it's been started up, run up to temperature, and maintained really, really fastidiously. Cars that sit around, unless you're on it, and you start them up, and you've got someone looking after them, they don't like it. You end up with way more bills. So, fully documented mileage, 23,000 miles. The mileage is down there. Yeah, 23 odd thousand miles. I've done a bit in it already. And history like you've never seen before. I bought it from Joe Macari as well, who are probably the name in classic Ferraris. There isn't anyone better at what they do. I mean, they've got the classic Ferrari service center on site, all officially authorized by Ferrari. So the right example came up and Franco there, he WhatsApp me, he's going, Tom, I know we've spoken about test rosters before. Are you in? Do you want one? I said, put that one aside for me. I'll have it. Money then. Money, 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 because we all like talking about money. We all like thinking about money. So how much was it? I'm not inclined to reveal exactly what I paid, uh, but I would say in the reach, less than 150K, shall we say. I paid less than 150K for the car. Obviously, I financed it because I finance everything. I've got 11 cars. I can't cash buy all of them. Uh, some of them are cash, very few, um, but I can't cash buy all of them. So this was financed through the lovely lot at Charles and Dean. They were the broker that found the best lender for this car. They finance all my cars. I find all my stuff through them and they literally will find the best lender for that particular asset. So this particular car, they found an amazing lender. Um, and I seem to recall it's about a grand a month or thereabouts, which doesn't seem so bad. Where's that gonna leave me in sort of two, three years time when I get itchy feet and think, oh, do I still want a classic Ferrari? I think these things are horrendously undervalued at the moment. And I think they've even seen a slight nudge recently. Can't think why that was. But I think for this car today, you're looking at 160 already, minimum. And I don't see why kind of an art grade, iconic Ferrari in collectible numbers in this spec won't be 225, 250 within the next two, three years, easily. I'm happy for this video to be brought up in two or three years time and reference to see if I'm right or wrong. But I honestly think that's where these are going. The early Testarossas, such an icon in Ferrari's lineup, and one of their last 12 cylinder rear engine cars. Uh, I know they did the TR and the, and the 512M after this. Ah, sorry. Having the Pininfarina badge on there just helps as well. 
So yeah, I really do think these things are good news and it's just, as I say, it's art. You look at it and you think, I might drive it today, I might not. Either way, I'm over the moon. What are my plans with this car? Am I going to take it on a tour of the world? Am I gonna take it to the Sahara Desert? Like Mr. Metcalf? No and no, I'm not gonna do either of those things. I don't have the balls <laughs> or the wallet to do things like that or the technical know-how. I just don't have the bottle for it. I would, I would hate to take it abroad. Generally, they're quite reliable and I don't suspect anything will really go wrong in it. I mean, they're pretty bulletproof. I was at Historic Auctions this morning looking at another one with 110,000 kilometers on the clock. They don't go bang. They are relatively easily fixable. There are lots of specialists now that work on them. I've seen Bob Houghton touted around quite a few times as someone that works on these things. And because the engine is on a subframe, it comes out relatively easily. The only thing you need to watch out for on them is a cam belt change, which you need to do every few years or so, depending on how many miles you do on it and all the rest of it. That job is around 3K, I've been led to believe. Maybe it's a bit more, a bit less, depending on where you go. It's not as scary as it can be on some cars, having the engine out because of that subframe that Ferrari put the engine on. So that's the only thing to really be wary of. An annual service, I think, of Ferrari is about 900 pounds if they don't find any nasties. Uh, but on the whole, that's about it. Not that scary. It's not that scary at all. It's not like your F40 uh, fuel tanks and whatnot that perish and you need a new one and they're tens of thousands and all that jazz. Um, it's not that scary. I'm not hugely bothered by the kind of upkeep and the bills potentially on this car. It's not gonna get driven a huge amount, probably do a thousand or two miles every year on it. So all in all, not hugely concerned about that. Other than bits and bobs involving costs and your know, running costs of the car, storage fit is about 300 pounds a month in London in a nice trickle charge space with my C-Tech plugged in. And insurance, it's hard to tell how much this actually was. I think you're looking at about 1,500 quid maybe for the year, maybe a grand. Um, all in, my cars all together, it's 18 grand for the year. And first point are the guys that sort that out. They're my broker uh, and they place the insurance policy with the best insurer for me. And that's open drive, you know, anyone under 30 can, can drive it and all the rest of it. So, so that's it in a nutshell, really. That's all my cost. That's what it's likely to cost me. And, you know, obviously there's gonna be hidden nasties and things that go wrong in it. Um, I suspect there's gonna be whatever down the line. Things go wrong on all cars, let alone old ones. So we'll see how that goes. But on the whole, it feels very well put together. It does actually, as I touched on before, feel slightly better put together in places than my D-Reg 911 Targa. Now this is a D-Reg as well. They're about six months apart in terms of uh, registration date. But this arguably does feel as well built. It's bonkers to think that. How long am I gonna hold on to this? Well, we'll see what happens in life. You know, I may well uh, need the money at some point. I may well not. I might just keep it. I don't know how much money I'm gonna make next month, let alone next year or the year after. So, uh, and that's what all these cars really hinge on. If I can afford to keep them, I keep them. I might get bored of it. Who knows? I love it at the moment, but I may well get bored of it. So who knows? That little braking patch there gives me a little talking point actually. The brakes are a little bit to uh, be desired. They are discs, not drums. Um, but being a big, heavy car that's 34 odd years old, braking is a little bit, uh, you've got to plan ahead basically, particularly if you're picking up pace like now. Feels like a big, heavy car, and of course, there's no power steering in this car at all. High speed maneuvering is easy enough, but when you get down to the low speed stuff, it's like going to the gym. There's a reassuring weight to it. <laughs> it does take bumps in its stride though. You don't feel thrown off. It's not skittish. It's not jittery. It carries its weight through bends. Oh, we got a dead squirrel. It carries its weight through bends quite well. Yeah, that's a third through there. Pick up on the exit. You know, you're not gonna set any PBs around your favorite country roads but is an experience, it's all hands on deck. It's not twitchy though, it does feel very planted and safe in a straight line. It's not like my F12, which is complete nonsense when you put your foot down. It's anyone's guess which way you're gonna end up pointing in that, but it's brilliant. I would urge anyone, ah, water, I hate water, no uh, rust. I would urge anyone who's thinking about getting a Testarossa, just do it. You'll regret it in a few years if you don't. 
It's one of the last iconic Ferraris to not go through the roof in value. If you look at any other icons in the Ferrari range, your F40s, your F50s, your 288 GTOs, yes, they're made in lower numbers, but they're millions and they're going to keep going. F40s will be two million quid in a couple of years. F50s, five million quid. Get in one of these before it's too late because they're getting hoovered. I've had four followers buy one of these in the past five weeks. They have DM'd me having bought one of these. Bit of heel and toe. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard in these clod hoppers. That's another consumer point there. Do not wear Nike Sakai waffles in your Testarossa because the pedals are ridiculously close together. I'm having to drive with the edges of my feet to make sure I don't press the wrong pedals. Now, getting out onto some uh, empty roads. Can you cruise on the motorway in this car? We've got someone. Calm yourself down, mate. Calm yourself down. Can you cruise in one of these? What is cabin noise like? Could you actually take this down to the south of France if you had a bucket full of cash We're in sixth gear at 60 miles an hour? I'm having to shout a little bit less. I'll turn the aircon up a little bit. On you go. That is actually mental how well that aircon works. You can cruise. You can cruise in it quite happily. You've got loads of storage in the front. You've got storage there as well. That shelf with actually uh, little tie straps that the F12 has uh, obviously adopted on through via the 599. Uh, stereo is completely appalling as you'd expect. You've got this flap under here with the world's worst head unit under there. I'm going to take it to Sexton's London and get the hi-fi done on it because the hi-fi is appalling um, as you'd expect. I mean, modern Ferraris are high-fi is appalling unless you outrate it, um, let alone something from 35 years ago. So I'm going to get a Blaupunk um, B46, I think it's called. Uh, the head unit that looks like an 80s radio, but isn't. Probably get a tiny subwoofer under one of the seats. I know that sounds chavvy, but trust me, it's not. Sexton's in an amazing way. Uh, and replace the speakers behind the standard grills. And basically get it all modern, uh, but without it looking it at all and ruining the kind of uh, the ethos of the car. I don't mind spoiling the originality because I think the head unit in here potentially isn't the one from new. Um, it looks like an 80s Pioneer one. I don't know what they're supposed to come with from new. I tried researching it, but didn't do a very good job. Um, so that is potentially the only mod I'm going to do to it. Am I going to put an exhaust on it? No, I'm going to leave it alone. It's a Classic A car. I'm going to leave it Classic A. I'm going to get serviced every year at Joe Macari. Uh, I'm going to get everything done to it. I'm going to keep it happy. Uh, drive it only in dry scenarios. Store it dry with a cover on it, on trickle charge, and I'm going to baby it. And if some of you don't like the fact I'm not going to thrash the wheels off it uh, and donut it and do hill climbs and stuff in it, then buy your own and trash that. But for me, that's the way I enjoy my cars and I want this ready to be enjoyed for years to come and also retain its value as well. Before I go then, because I just want to field some 355 chat, I got so many people saying, why didn't you buy a 355? I didn't have a 355 on my wall when I was a kid. I didn't watch 355s on Miami Vice. I didn't play with 355s on OutRun. It was the Testarossa. Testarossa is part of popular culture. Testarossa is the icon of the 80s. There is no mistaking a Testarossa. It's just a bucket list car. Will this car be beneficial for the channel? Will this car make me money? Who knows at this point? I don't think this will do the mental views this car either. I keep buying cars that don't, uh, but these are cars that I love and these are cars that I want to build an audience with and get an audience of people that like the same stuff as me with. I realized a few of my videos recently, I haven't got many views at all, but to be honest with you, I don't care. It's building the right people and I'm starting to do more work in the classic world. I'm starting to get work with more brands in the classic world. I've obviously got classic giveaways now, which we're giving away a 944 Turbo S. That will be ending very, very, very shortly probably within the coming day or two by the time this video goes out. So you haven't already got your ticket for the Porsche 944 Turbo S Silver Rose Edition. Make sure you get in the mix with that. The more you support that, the more likely we are to build up to things like Testarossas and absolute madness with classic giveaways. So 
that is all coming soon um, and there is method to my madness there is a reason why I'm buying cars like this and why I've ended up with a Testarossa I couldn't be more in love and I honestly thought before I bought this thing I'm not going to test drive it because it's going to be a heap of junk it's going to be awful but boy oh boy has it surpassed my expectations it is so much better to drive than I thought it would be it's absolutely brilliant anyway on that note thank you very much for watching do subscribe blah 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 and before I go make sure you hit the link below to car vertical who will get you your report on the next car you buy to make sure you're not being stung for now see you later guys bye